Hey Summit family, my name's Jamie and I'm one of the pastors here and it truly is an honor that you've joined us today. We believe deep in our hearts that God has something unique that he wants to say to you and that he wants to challenge you and to transform you. And we exist as a church to guide you to an elevated life in Jesus. Way he speaks is through his word. See the creation symbolically. And then we have changes in our circumstances. God is speaking. Are you listening? We're starting a new series this morning. Uh, so I'm excited to start it off called God Speaks, as you saw from the uh, intro video there. And um, this is a very important thing for us as Christians, right? To hear God's word. It's, it's, it's not just enough just to, uh, you know, to do our duly, daily duties or rituals or whatever. We need to hear from God, don't we? And uh, so we're going to talk about that this morning. Uh, most of us are never going to hear that audible, booming voice, right? Like that you, sometimes you hear uh, or you see on the movies or you've heard maybe in the, read in the Old Testament when uh, some people would hear from God. But there's a number of different ways that God speaks to us today as his children. And so over this series, over the next six weeks, uh, we're going to look at six different ways that God speaks to us today. The question is, are we listening? God is speaking. Are we listening? And so this morning, we're going to begin our series by looking at how God speaks through his word, through the scriptures. Of course, the Bible is not just a book, it's a series of, of letters. It's, it's God's roadmap for us, right? It's his love letter, it's his, it's his instruction manual for us. And through this book, God is speaking daily to his children. So it's a very important book for us, to follow, for us as followers of Christ. Some of you may remember my, my younger brother, Robert, he came up a few years ago and he shared some of his story, but um, he has another interesting story involving his Bible that I want to share with you. Uh, so as he was finishing up his internship in uh, December of 20, 2002, back in Newfoundland, that's where we grew up. He's pastoring in St. John's, Newfoundland. Uh, he and the lead pastor had some meetings in another town called Lewisport. Tia knows where that is. It's one person. That's good. Maybe someone else. Anybody else know where that is? Anybody? Oh, oh, we got a hand in the back. I see that hand, brother. That's good. I always like to say that. So they were heading to Lewisport for some meetings, and uh, of course, being the time of year it was, if anyone's driven to Newfoundland or even, you know, northern Ontario, it was very similar, uh, you got to check the forecast before you leave. And so they checked the forecast, and wasn't the greatest forecast, wasn't probably the best day to drive, but you know what they said, we'll take our time and we'll just, we'll try and get there. Along the way, the wind had started to blow, and, and uh, as they approached a bridge, the wind gusted up really, really bad, and it caused instant whiteout conditions. They, in, in a split second, they couldn't see anything. And unknown to them, just in front of them on the bridge was a plow truck with a salt spreader on it, out course trying to keep the roads clear and safe. They were doing about 80 to 90 kilometer, kilometers an hour at the time uh, when this wind gusted up and took their vision away. And of course, they did not see the truck, and they slammed right into the back of this, this plow truck. And one, there's a couple things here, but for, first of all, thankfully, if they, they had that salt spreader on, he said that probably saved their life because if not, they would have ran right underneath the truck and would have been decapitated or, or something. So they, they were, they were uh, relatively okay, other than a few bruises, of course. Uh, but shortly after the, tr the car hit the truck, it burst into flames. And of course, they got out as quick as they could. But since it was the end of my brother's internship, all the things that he had brought with him, he had packed in the car to bring back home to my parents' house before they left to go back to Peterborough to finish up his last semester. So he had his clothes, he had his books, he had hockey equipment, he had computer, like all, basically, and he had just gotten married that summer, so you guys can understand, like he pretty much had all of, half of his possessions with him in this car, and he was like frantically, frantically trying to save whatever he could. He's throwing stuff out in the snowbank, and within like seconds, the car was engulfed in just this black smoke. So he's 
reaching out around the back seat, just whatever he can grab, throwing it out. Some, some things got damaged, but he was able to save most of his stuff. Of course, the police and the fire department showed up to put the fire out, and they towed the, what remained of the car to a nearby town. A couple days later, uh, my brother got a, a phone call from the police department. And they said they were going through, through over the car and, you know, like they would just investigate, make sure, see what went, went wrong. And uh, they found something that they wanted to share with them. Now, keep in mind that the fire was so hot that anything that could have burned or melted was, did that, it burned or melted. Including the tires, the seat, the electrical, basically anything that wasn't metal burned or melted. But the one thing that didn't burn that they found in the car was my brother's leather-bound Bible. He had it in the box of books in the back seat, but I guess in the accident, somehow it got jammed underneath the seat. And uh, other, they said it shrunk a little bit from the heat, the leather did, and there was a little bit of singe mark on the edge of the, of the pages. But other than that, it was pretty much intact. The only thing that survived that fire was his Bible. And I'm, I thought, man, what a testimony to those police officers who found that, that the God's word is powerful. It's alive. It speaks us to, to us today. And so we need to take the powerful word of God and get it in our hearts and listen and see what God is saying. So let's read together 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 to 17. I'm reading from the ESV here if you have it. Uh, you can look it up if you have U versions on your phone. I'm not sure if we have the normal thing loaded. Jamie can let us know. But if you do see it, it's under events. It may be there. Uh, but anyway, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 to 17 says, You, ho however, uh, this is Paul speaking to Timothy. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, and my steadfastness. My persecutions, my sufferings that happened to be at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Verse 12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. For, verse 14, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. Verse 16, here's the key verse this morning. And I just realized I don't have my clicker. I don't know where it is. So if somebody can get it for me or just push the next slide. Uh, I don't think I have this one up yet. But uh, verse 16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Let me read that again. Verse 16, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for your word this morning. We know that you speak to us today through your word. And God, we want to hear you. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear what you have to say to us, not only this morning, but in the days to come and the weeks ahead. And so as we just take some time this morning just to dive into your word and just to see what you have to say, I pray, God, you would open our hearts and open our ears to what you want to teach us this morning, that we might be enriched and changed by your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. God speaks to us through his word. The truths contained in it teach us and correct us and equip us to do his will. And Paul, speaking to Timothy, encourages him to continue in what he was taught. You guys can put that first point up there if you want, to continue in what he was taught. He warns him that everyone who desires to follow Jesus will be persecuted in some form or another. Isn't that wonderful, the news? <laughs> if you desire to follow Jesus, you're going to be persecuted in some form or another. It's just going to happen. That's just not, that's part of this life. And he says, and to be on guard against imposters or false teachers, basically people who will try and pull him away from the truth of God's word. Even back then, Paul says the imposters and evil people will go from bad to worse. Sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? Where there's a lot of false teachings and things that just seem to be getting worse all the time. And so Paul's warning to young Timothy 
even applies to us today. Continue in what you have, uh, continue in what you were taught. Continue in what you were taught. And Paul, so Paul's warning, sorry, in, in verse 14 and 15, Paul says again, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. Let me read that again. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. He encourages Timothy not to be deceived or led astray by the imposters and false teachers around him, but to continue in the truth that he's been taught and what he firmly believes. So many people today don't have a firm foundation of God's word in their lives and and in their hearts so that when someone comes along with teachings and ideas that sound good to our ears but aren't lined up with God's word, they get easily deceived, they get easily distracted, sidelined. Paul doesn't want that to happen to Timothy or to anyone else. This is why teaching God's word to our children is so important. We need to give them a good foundation so that when when they're young, so that when they're older, they won't be as easily deceived. So parents, can I speak to you for a second? Or grandparents. We have a great responsibility to teach God's word to our children, don't we? We have a great responsibility When Paul says, knowing from whom you have learned it, he was referring to Timothy's grandmother and mother and Paul himself. uh, Timothy had a rich upbringing in God's word. He was taught at a young age by his mother and grandmother and Paul. And so now Paul's saying, lean upon that truth that you've got deep in your heart as a child. Lean upon that, the truth that you know, so that when false teachers and imposters come around, you can know the truth. And you guys know, we've spoken it up already this morning, we value children in the, at the summit. That's why we made the decision. We want to go back to having them in service for a couple of songs starting in the fall. And we know how much effort and care that our, our kids' workers put into each and every Sunday. And can I just stop and say thank you to each and every one, anyone that's in this room. If you have any involvement in kids at all, thank you for what you do. We appreciate you so much. However, parents, this does not mean you get off the hook, right? What happens here on a Sunday morning is good when they're up in their classroom and they're being taught by our wonderful uh, teachers, but it's best served as a supplement to what they're learning at home, right? Because if they only hear about Jesus on Sundays for about one hour, that's not enough, is it? So we need to take the responsibility as parents to make sure our kids are hearing about Jesus, to get God's word into their hearts and lives. Doesn't mean you got to prepare a lesson. If you want to, great, go for it. But we need to make God's word a part of our everyday lives, just a normal part of what we do. Deuteronomy, I love this portion of scripture. It says to teach our kids as we walk and and as we talk and go about our day. Just, Just weave it into your normal everyday life, what you do. Verse 6 of chapter 6 says, These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you rise up, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Parents, look for those moments when you have an opportunity to share a truth about Jesus and who he is. Or, or something about the Bible, about who God is, about a Bible story. When they ask questions, don't say, uh, I'm busy. Stop and take the time and tell them as best as you can. If you need some help, we're here to help you. But take that time as a parent and tell them about the Bible, about Jesus. Encourage your kids to read the Bible by, by getting them some age-appropriate Bibles or books or devotionals or other resources. I brought some this morning just to show you, and you guys can come and see them after. This is a a girl's devotional Bible, and uh, it has little pages that you can color. Isn't that cute? And all through it, there's little things you can, you know, about uh, different Bible stories, and they can color in different things. This is, uh, for those who are geeky like me, and you like comic books, this is a comic book Bible for teens. And there's all kinds of different ones. There's ones for, you know, kids, you know, younger ages. This is more of a teen level, so you wouldn't want to get this one for your kids, younger kids. 
And last year, if you remember, remember we went through this story? Anybody remember that? You're like, no, I slept through the whole year. I didn't. Anyways, this is the kids' version of the story. And look at, and you probably can't see them, but look at that, if you can see it. Like there's just vivid pictures, just little short little stories. There's a little thing of kind of recap. Use some of these, like just make it a normal part of what they do. Take some time before they go to bed and say, let's take five minutes and read a little story together. And if there's any questions, great. If not, like, I'm tired. Let's go to sleep. Okay, let's go to sleep. But just make it an everyday normal part of your routines. We can't wait until they get older and say, well, when they get older, when I can sit down and have a conversation with them, I'll, I'll, I'll teach them then. It's too late. It's never too late, but it's better to do it when they're younger, of course. And you get that foundation. You get God's word into them. Because God's word is important. It's how he speaks to us and our children today. And so we must make it an everyday part of our lives. In the next few verses, Paul makes some very important uh, statements about the scriptures that we need to understand. First of all, he says that the scriptures are holy or sacred. He uses another word. Verse 15, again, he said, and how, you, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, sacred or holy. The commentator Warren Wearsby says, the sacred letters is a literal translation. The, the suggestion is that the young Timothy learned his Hebrew alphabet by spelling his way through the Old Testament scriptures. The word for holy means consecrated for sacred use. And he says, the Bible is different from every other book, isn't it? Even books about the Bible, because it has been set apart by God for special sacred use. We must treat the Bible as the special book it is. It's not just another book. It's holy. It's sacred. And Paul describes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 about how we should view God's word. And he says in verse 13, Therefore we never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you didn't think our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. Because the scriptures are, are sacred, because they're holy, Paul says that it leads us to salvation. The scriptures lead us to salvation. He continues in, in verse 15, he says, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And when Paul uses this phrase to make you wise, he's referring to teaching, instruction. Knowing the scriptures makes us wise, makes a person wise, makes us, helps us understand our need of salvation. Because without God's word, we wouldn't understand that we need a savior. And through Paul's writings, he associates the knowledge of truth with salvation. Another great writer that I love reading, N.T. Wright, he says, the spirit speaking through scriptures can make us wise. Let me say that again. The spirit Speaking through scripture can make us wise, can help us think in new patterns, see things we hadn't seen before, and understand ourselves and other people and God and the world, and ultimately find ourselves rescued, saved from the downward pull of sin and death, and transformed by God's forgiving grace so that we become a part of his new creation. As we read and study God's word, it sinks deep into our hearts and in our minds. And it changes the way we think, the way we act, the way we respond, the way we see the world around us. It's not enough just to read the word and know it intellectually. We need to respond in faith to Jesus. God's word shows us that we were lost in our sin and we, we, we needed a savior. And once we understand this, we need to respond to the offer of salvation and put our trust in him. God's word is like a mirror. It reveals who we are, that we're not perfect. I know that comes as a shocker. We've all sinned in some form or way or another, right? Romans 3, 23, a lot of you know this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We don't even come close to measuring up to God's standard. But thankfully, God's word tells us that he offers a way for us to be made right. John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish and have eternal life. Verse 17. God sent his son 
into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Are you glad for that? That we weren't left in our sin, but God made a way. The scriptures not only lead us to the knowledge of salvation through faith in Jesus, but when we have moments of doubt, God's word also gives us an assurance of our salvation. 1 John 5 and verse 10 says, All who believe in the Son of God know in their hearts that this testimony is true. Those who don't believe these, this are actually calling God a liar because they don't believe what God has testified about his Son. Verse 11, And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Verse 12, this is the key. Whoever has the Son has life. Period. Let me say that again. Whoever has the Son has life. And whoever does not have the Son, God's Son, does not have life. We can be assured that if, if we've asked Jesus to forgive us of our sin, and if we put our faith and trust in him to lead and to guide us, then we know that we have life through him. Amen? And you know what? This is something that so many people struggle with. And, and you know, as I was a younger Christian, I struggled with this sometimes. Am I really saved? Does God really save me? How am I doing? And Satan causes us to have doubts about the assurance of our salvation, doesn't he? But God speaks through his word and he helps us understand that we can be sure of our salvation. We don't have to doubt, not because of anything that we've done, not because we've piled up these great works that we've done, but because of Jesus. If you have the son, you have life. As simple as that. And as we grow and mature, mature the, the scriptures become our spiritual food, something that we grow on. First Peter says that when we first come to faith in Jesus, like a newborn, we need to crave spiritual milk. That's how we get the sustenance that we need. And as we grow and as we get older in our faith, we need to move on to more solid foods and move away from the simple truths of the, the milk and get into deeper truths of God's word and keep growing, keep digging, keep going further. It also becomes a weapon for fighting Satan when he tempts us and overcoming temptation. Guess what? Here, Jesus was tempted by Satan. So we should be ready for it as well, right? Who are, who, if Jesus himself was tempted, then certainly we will be too. But God's word acts like a sword to give us a weapon to fight the enemy's attack. In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was fasting for 40 days, some of you might remember this story. He was hungry. You can imagine going out in the desert for 40 days with nothing to eat. I can go, barely go four hours, let alone 40 days. And so Satan tempted him. He said, turn that rock into a piece of bread. I know you're hungry. Jesus could have easily done that. He could have called angels to come and bring him food. But there was a purpose he had in this 40-day fast and if he had eaten, then he would have been off of that purpose. And Satan knew that, and he was trying to get him off that purpose. And so Jesus responded by quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. He said, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. People don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Of course, if you know the story, Satan tried a couple more times. But each time, Jesus used scripture as a weapon to fend off the attacks of the enemy. Satan tried to twist what the scriptures were saying, but Jesus refuted him each time. He said, no, no, no. This is what the scripture is saying. I know you're trying to twist it. This is what it actually says. Satan knows the scriptures very, very well. And so we need to know it as best as we can so that when he comes to you and says something that, that kind of sounds right, but it's not, we can say, like Jesus, no, Satan, this is what God's word says because I've been reading it, I've been studying it, God's been speaking to me, and I know what his word says. So get out of here. We can use it as a weapon to fend off what he's trying to do. We can use scripture as a weapon and, and be sure of our salvation because the scriptures are true and dependable. They are true and dependable. Paul says in verse 16 that all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is is breathed out by God. Paul had just talked about how the scriptures are able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. But now Paul wants to emphasize the importance of God's word 
He says that all scripture is breathed out by God. And he uses a Greek word here, and I'm not a Greek um, expert or anything, but I think it's pronounced uh, theonoustos. And if you, if you know Greek, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But basically, it means inspired. The Greek word when he says God breathed it out, it means inspired, inspired by God. Of course, it was men and that there was people, humans, that actually did the writing of the words of the Bible. But they didn't write it from their own intellect. They didn't write it from their own research. It was inspired or breathed out by the breath of God. It was directly from God. And so because it's from God, Scripture is true and dependable. We can stand upon what the Scriptures say as a sure foundation. When things feel like we're just walking on beach sand, we were out at the beach the other day, and I was like, man, the, tar- the most tiring part of being at the beach is walking back and forth out of the sand, putting stuff away. You're just trudging through the sand, it sinks down, right? When we're walking through times when we feel like we're just trudging down in the sand or we feel like, man, everything is just chaotic around me. I don't know what is going on. We can stand upon God's word. We can stand upon the truth of the scriptures because they're true and dependable. And the more we read and the more we study the scriptures, we hear God's voice speak to us and it becomes more and more familiar. Just like when you spend time with your family or your friends and you become familiar with their voice and the way that they speak and the way they act. And you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's so-and-so. Yeah, that's him or that's her. And Satan tries to deceive us and make us question God's voice sometimes. It makes us question, uh, is God's word really inspired by him? It's just a bunch of stories. It's not really inspired by God. Did God really say that or did he say this? He did that to Eden. Or sorry, Eve right in the Garden of Eden. He said... Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Put a little, trying to plant seeds of doubt. Did God really say that? And of course we know Eve doubted. And we know what happened after that. The words of scripture are breathed out by God. He is the God of truth. Deuteronomy 32 tells us, verse 4. So we can know that his words are true and his words are dependable. We can trust his word. Paul also says that the scriptures are valuable. The second half of verse 16, he says, they're they're profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. They're profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. God's word is valuable because it teaches us what is right and what's wrong. It corrects us when we go astray. It helps us to continue in a right relationship with God. We need God's word to help us stay on the path of righteousness. It's our guide in how we should live. N.T. Wright also explains this. He says, as we read scripture, it will from time to time inform us in no uncertain terms that something we've been doing is out of line with God's will. Have you been there? You're reading through and you're like, oh, I don't want to read this because this is speaking to me. And God's telling me, yep, you need to correct something here. He goes on, he says, sometimes this will lie plainly on the surface of the text. And other times as we read a passage, we will begin to hear the voice of God gently or perhaps not so gently telling us that this story applies to an area of our life or perhaps another one. When that happens, he says, as many often times it does for those who read the Bible prayerfully, he says, we do well to pay attention. We do well to pay attention. When God is speaking to you through your, his word and says, pay attention to this, pay attention to that. I want you to learn from something from here. I'm, I'm going to correct you a little bit. I'm going to put you back on the right path. You've gotten off the path a little bit. I need to correct you a little bit. Kind of like those, you know, first time I, I rented a car with the lane correction. You ever drive those? Freaked me right out. I'm like, something's wrong with this car. I'm going to turn it around. But then I realized, okay, it's actually something good. If I start to drift, it's going to bring me right back in to where I need to be. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let me say that again. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God speaks to us through his word and keeps us from stumbling around in the dark into dangerous territory. So we can't ignore his voice when we hear him speaking to us, when we're reading his word and he points something out and he says, pay attention. We can't ignore his voice. 
It may not always be easy to hear, but it'll keep us from dangers that we may not see that are lying ahead. It's a story about uh, a former park ranger at Yellowstone National Park. Uh, he was leading a group of hikers out to uh, a fire lookout. And the ranger was so intent on telling the hikers about all the flowers and, and the animals as they're walking along that he considered all the messages he was getting on his two-way radio distracting, and so he switched it off so he could concentrate on teaching. And so as he got closer to the tower, the, the ranger was met by a lookout who was just out of breath. He ran up to kind of tell them something, and he was like, why did you turn off your radio? They had discovered that a grizzly bear had been stalking the group, and the authorities were trying to warn them of the danger. And they were pretty close, but he ran ahead and, and warned them. So anytime we tune out God's, the message that God has sent us, anytime God speaks to us, he sends someone else to speak God's word to us. And we ignore that. We tune it out. We put not only ourselves at risk, but everyone around us. It's so important that we never turn off God's saving communication, his word, his holy scripture. And lastly, Paul says that the scriptures equip us for service. They equip us for service. He says, verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The, the New Living Translation puts it this way. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. God's word prepares us and equips us to do the work that he's calling us to do. He has something for each one of us. He, he has a will for our lives. And this happens as we read and study the scriptures and we allow him to speak to us and we let his word direct and guide us. And the better we know God's word, the better we are prepared to understand what he wants us to do. And the better we are equipped to live and work for him. Warren Wiersbe again says, the purpose of Bible study is not just to understand doctrines or to be able to defend the faith. Those are good things. As important as these, these are, he says, the ultimate purpose is the equipping of the believers who read it. And I think we have this up here. God, it is the word of God that equips God's people to do the work of God. Let me read that again. If you guys, there, there it is. It is the word of God that equips God's people to do the work of God. God doesn't ask us to do something and then leave us to figure it out on our, on our own. You, you, have you ever had a job like that? You're like, this needs to be put here or this needs to be done and we need this file. Okay, figure it out. And they take off. Don't, don't mention any names or anything. But have you ever, have you ever had a situation like that where somebody's given you a task to do and they don't tell you how to do it or how, what, to, how to, you know, here are your tools, you know, here's some teaching, just figure it out. God doesn't do that. He asks us, he calls us, he and he equips us. He gives us his word so that we can have that, that to train us and prepare us. And our job is to read it, to study it, and listen for what he has to say to us. It's there. We just need to pick it up and read it. God speaks to us in many ways. I'm going to call the worship team back. God speaks to us in, in many ways. And one is through his word, the Bible, the scriptures. Of course, we may not hear that audible voice that we have saw in scripture, in, in movies or anything like that, but we can hear God speak through the words of his scripture. Paul reminds Timothy and us that there are a lot of false teachers out there, people who try and deceive us with well-crafted arguments and teachings that sound good to our ear, but they're not based on God's word. Paul encourages, him to, to, encourages Timothy to continue and what he was taught by his mother, by his grandmother, by Paul as well. And as persecution come and false teachers surround him, he can stand firm on the truth of the scriptures that he learned at a young age. Parents, we too have that responsibility to instill God's word into the hearts and minds of our children so that when the times of testing come down the road, because they will, Paul says they're going to happen, that they have a foundation to stand on. The reason Paul encourages Timothy to continue in what he was taught is because they're sacred. They're holy scriptures. It's not just a regular book. It's something, there's something different about it. It's God's word to us. It's his guidebook. 
what he wants to say. And because the scriptures are sacred and holy, Paul said that it, it leads us to salvation. It shows us that we've all sinned and then we're in need of a savior. It gives us the, the assurance when we need it, when we have moments of doubt. It gives us a daily food we need and a weapon to use against the attack of the enemy. We can use scripture as a weapon and be assured of our salvation because the scriptures are true and dependable. They're true and dependable. We can stand upon the truth of God's word. Paul says that they are breathed out or inspired by God. They are his words to us. And God's word is valuable, valuable because it teaches us what is right and what's wrong. It corrects us when we go astray and it helps us understand how to stay in right relationship with God. And lastly, Paul says, scriptures equip us for service. God calls us to follow him, but he doesn't leave us to figure it out on our own. He's given us his word, the Bible, the scriptures to give us direction. God is speaking through his word. The question is, are we listening? Are we listening? Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your guide book, Lord, that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, that you've called us, but you, you haven't left us alone. You've equipped us. You've given us the tools that we need. And God, I pray that you would help us to make scripture a, a regular part of our everyday lives. And God, that you would help us to, as parents to teach it to our children, to give them a firm foundation of a solid truth to stand upon, Lord, when, when things come against them, when, when they're unsure, when they're attacked, that they would know your word and they would know what you have to say. So God, I pray that you would help us to make your word the, an, an important part of our lives, God, that we would listen to what you have to say to us. So Lord, help us to hear what you have to say in Jesus' name.